Yeah, and in case you don't know, Grove Maiden makes a whole line of uh, beautiful products from wood, leather, and metal. All right here, designed, engineered, manufacturing. We're totally vertically, vertically integrated, and we practice lean. Um, thanks, Norman. And uh, yeah, it's an awesome company. Check us out, grovemade.com, and it's right here in Portland. Uh, and then I also uh, co-own and run an organization called Portland Made that was founded by Kelly Roy. She's in attendance tonight. Thanks, for, thanks Kelly, for starting Portland Made. And Portland Made um, helps support and uh, have services for maker businesses. Um, so we help folks network, meet each other, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel if you're starting off and you're really passionate about a product or an idea, but not necessarily a business person. We can help you with that. Um, we can point you in the right direction for business service providers if you don't know where to turn for a lawyer, or banker, etc. And then we also um, help you sell your goods. Uh, so, for example, this Friday at Pioneer Place Mall, you can go to the mall and buy local goods um, with an event we're doing with WeWork there on the third floor at Pl uh, Pioneer Place Mall. So it's called Creator Market. I printed off these neat little flyers. Uh, there's some at the doors uh, right there, but yeah, it's from noon, uh, sorry, yeah, noon to six uh, on Friday at Pioneer Place Mall. Um, check it out. Pick up some good uh, gifts for the holidays. We'll have some free drinks, music. Should be fun. That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Okay, next up is Matt Horvat. Um, he is the... Uh, proud leader of Lean Portland. He started Lean Portland in 2010. He's going to tell us a little more about that and also uh, a little introduction for Norman as well. Stand down here. Yeah. Can I stand down here, folks? Uh-oh. I'll take the signal. Well, welcome. I'm really thrilled you guys are all here and turned out tonight. Um, my name is Matt Horvat with Lean Portland. Um, can we get a quick hand raise for the rest of us in the room here? Uh, Brian, Alex, Dave, Ernest, Maria, Brett is not with us tonight, and Jared. Uh, so we're a volunteer group. Uh, we're registered as a business company, but um, what you see tonight is really we pulled off with very little money uh, and a lot of time from these guys chipping in and contributing because of the passion they bring. So it's I'm really glad to be on this team. They're pretty neat folks. So, um, so we're all improvement professionals. Our tagline is we help people make work better. And uh, we work for nonprofit clients. So our work is pro bono uh, for people who don't normally have exposure to operations excellence kind of help. Um, so with be being a benefit company on our website, soon to be, is our first annual benefit report. On it, you'll see that uh, we're seven consultants, 30 or so volunteers who turn out and help us out on weekends when we volunteer at our clients like Free Geek and Rebuilding Center. Uh, about 500 people-ish are, are, are paying attention to us through different social media outlets. This year in 2017, we've uh, volunteered at three clients. In those clients, about 30 employees are directly impacted by our work, and we've uh, donated about 700 hours of our time helping these guys out. So a quick shout-out to our sponsors. Uh, a big round of applause for, um, well, let's do, them, let's do them at the end here. Uh, IISE Portland, the Institute of Industrial Engineers chapter, donated uh, enough money to contribute for our snacks and beer. Uh, Portland Made and Grove Made, as Jim has uh, uh, spoken to us a little bit about, big supporters. Organizers Northwest always turns out in force to help us out. Uh, photos by Kim tonight. Van Zoen and Business Process Improvement. We're also supported by uh, Portland Business Journal, Pacific Northwest College of Arts, Portland State University, West Coast Event Productions, and uh, Keaton Aver Averman, and uh, Sven Schultz of Rose City Digital Marketing. Thanks, guys. <laughs> so let me introduce Norman a little bit, and, uh, and then I'll have something to say about Kale, too. So I want to start with a question. What does it mean to be productive? It was in the 1970s when Norman started exploring productivity, and it was a solo mission. No one else in the developed world was focused on this. And why should they? The US GDP at that time was twice that of all developing countries combined, and 10 times that of its nearest developed neighbor. Yet Norman was the curious one asking, what is productivity? And it is still this question that brings us all together 
and what we have dedicated our lives to exploring. Norman's work has connected us through all the books he's published. On his journey, he's met Dr. W. Edwards Deming, Dr. Joseph Duran, Phil Crosby, the Zero Defects guy, Dr. Ishikawa Fishbone, uh, and Dr. Akeo, uh, the Hoshin Connery, and also Mr. Taichi Ono. He's gone to Japan more than 80 times, visited more than 250 plants, and published more than 100 Japanese management books in English. He's had a personal relationship with Shigeo Shingo and helped him receive his honorary doctorate from the University of Utah, whereby he also co-founded the Shingo Prize. He's responsible for bringing many productivity-related ideas to Western readers. A very short list is Kaizen, Andon, Hoshin Kanri, Kanban, Quick and Easy Kaizen, and 5S. Mr. Bodek is one of the few to be personally awarded the Shingo Prize for his 2005 book, Kaikaku, The Power and Magic of Lean. In 2010, he was inducted to Industry Week's Manufacturing Hall of Fame, being recognized as one of a team of industrial superstars whose collective careers has had an immeasurable impact and influence on U.S. manufacturing. I first met Norman when my employer hired him to teach me about Quick and Easy Kaizen. During this training, Norman spoke to me about how we are traditionally disincentivized with copying other people. Uh, copying others is, is cheating and this is bad. Intellectually speaking, this is a fallacy and that limits learning and Norman showed me how to break through these hidden messages with passion and inspire people to do more for themselves how to create an and how to create that environment for my employees. Even presently, I'm reminded about the content he's provided. My, in healthcare, my firm is currently hiring top dollar consultants to teach us about the content that was brought to the West by Norman in the 90s. Thank you, Norman, for all that you've done for us. Thank you. And so let me introduce Kale Van Zon, Norman's interviewer tonight and moderator. Kale is a solopreneur that is the archetype of my generation. He's done a dozen crafts and owned a half a dozen businesses. Through connecting deeply with people, he found himself halfway around the planet, thriving in, a, in an economy that needs his core message. Kale thrives helping people see better ways to be. He teaches tools, but first teaches how relationships based on trust and vulnerability are critical to things working properly. He has high standards for himself, and I'm proud to be on his team. He, too, is trying to answer the question, what does it mean to be productive? Thanks, Kale. Thanks, Matt. It's about the nicest thing anybody's ever said about me. I mean, not in a good way. Okay, I got my own little introduction here. I also have not memorized it. Um, when I first read about Lean, this is going back probably about eight years now, I think, I always thought there was something deeper about it that I just couldn't put my finger on. And there was, there was just something about the way that Lean looked at organizations that made so much sense to me. And I don't just mean from the perspective of like, it makes you more money, because that doesn't necessarily always make sense to me. It's nice, but it's not the be all and end all. Uh, as I delved deeper into my Lean journey, it became clear that Lean was allowing me to run an organization with more humility. Allowing me to do that and to be a kind of leader and be more effective at the same time as well. Running our organization in a way that cared about people and the place in which we live. It was a way that was more humanistic. It was allowing us to be an organization that was serving humanity in a positive way. And the more I studied and I immersed myself into Lean, the more I realized that if you follow these basic principles, and a lot of them are really basic, the money somehow came by itself. The, the bottom line ultimately took care of itself. And even through Lean, from a financial perspective, uh, even though Lean, from a financial perspective, is much more focused on people on the balance sheet, uh, than the bottom line of the income statement. And Lean was doing that for us, but I did, didn't understand how it was doing that. Lean was like somehow creating profit for us by not focusing on the bottom line. We were focused on people, we were focused on the balance sheet, and it was still working for us. So in one of the first books I ever read that was published by Norman, right up here on Sandy Boulevard, back in 1979 was the first one? 81 or 82, okay. And this was before the term lean ever existed. Uh, and Taichi Ono, the father of lean, he referred to his system about being about respect for humanity. And in fact, it was several decades before it was actually called lean. 
So it was called Respect for Humanity, then it was called Toyota Production System, and then decades later they turned it lean. But the books don't really talk about what Respect for Humanity looks like or how you can go about implementing that in your business and creating that kind of culture. I also realized that something must have been lost in translation from Japan to America. In my experience, in the US, lean at best is often hugely misunderstood, or at worst, it's used to do pretty bad things. You know, if you want to go lean, you can do that, and then you can lay off a whole bunch of people because you save yourself a bunch of labor. And it's used that way here. And that doesn't really sound like respect for humanity to me. So if I could, I would have contacted Mr. Taichi Ono himself, the father of lean, but he's no longer around. However, earlier this year, I find out that Norman Burdick here is still around and living in Portland and still working at age 85, which is incredible. And I was so excited when I had found that out that I wanted to reach out to him, which I did, and ask him some of these questions. And then I was like, well, maybe other people are interested in hearing about this too, which apparently there are. So here we are. And it is interesting to me that this hasn't happened before. You know, Norma's been here this whole time for 30 years, and somehow the business community in Portland has not capitalized on this fact. So shame on us. It's an opportunity, no blame. And I don't know why that is the case, but that's, that's past history. So the point is that once I found out he was still living here, I wanted to ask him these questions. So um, yeah, without much further ado, Norman, would you please come and take the stage with me? And let's talk. So for the agenda, I think we're going to go back and forth a little bit between questions that we've prepared at Lean Portland and then also some audience questions. So if you have questions, start thinking now. Uh, and we'll have somebody come around with a mic. Uh, and please do speak into the mic because we're recording this tonight. So the, the soundtrack for the video is all coming from the mics. So don't ask questions without having a mic. Um, OK, Norman. So um, I got one question. The first one is kind of two parts, which is what does respect for humanity mean to you? And if Taichi Ono was still here today, how might he describe it? Okay, thank you very much for coming. I'm amazed that you came out uh, to see me. It's really funny because I said to my wife, well, maybe if we're lucky, 30 people will come. And then she said, you'll be lucky if three people come. <laughs> <laughs> it's curious. So thank you for showing up. 125 people sound signed up, but about half came. Maybe because it's raining out. <laughs> no, not 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 really. But I, you came tonight, and you didn't pay anything. Is that right? Okay, but nothing is free in life. Nothing is free. So, I want you to pay something. And what I want you to pay is I want you to come up with questions. That's your payment for tonight. You all must pay by coming up with questions because that's one of the ways you only learn. If you sit there, the brain goes a little bit, you know, it doesn't absorb. And the whole thing about lean, the whole thing we're trying to do is that you can apply something, you can do something, you can create a new environment. And this is wonderful of Matt and, 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 and Kel to do this. I'm very happy to do it with you. So the first question he asked was about the whole idea of respect for people and oh no. So I'm going to, I'm going to, Break one myth, because Ono really didn't create respect for people. That came many years later. At first, Toyota had two pillars for their success. One, one pillar was just in time, or the Toyota production system. Or how do we get flow? This is the key word, flow. And all of you should be taking notes. So you have a sheet of paper to pass that you can write on the back of it. You should take notes. Is <laughs> You should, unless you, even if you have a mind that can record it all, how do you begin to use it? You, we have to create action. So that respect for people came later. And then, oh no, this is a funny story, but don't tell anybody else. <laughs> just before Shingo died, see, two people created this whole idea of lean or just in time. It came from Dr. Shigeo Shingo, and it came from Taichi Ono. Even Toyota does not recognize Shingo the way I do. But when I work with the top managers at Toyota, and I would say to them, 
who, who, who invented just in time? Oh, no, a shingo. And the answer was, which came first, the chicken or the egg? And that comes from the source, and, and I love it, because I spent a lot more time with Shingo than Ono. I spent time with both, and I became their American publisher. I translated, I had translated their books from Japanese to English. So I'm sitting with Shingo just three weeks before he died. But don't tell this to anybody else. And Shingo said to me, Norman, I know you're working with Ono's assistants, and I was. Two of the assistants asked me to bring him to America, and I did. And he said, I want you to know this, that Ono is absolutely ruthless. I'm changing an understanding. <laughs> ruthless. But he was also wonderful in that ruthlessness. And I want you to understand that tonight also, the power of that great man. The enormous power. Because he would go into the, he knew in his vision what he wanted. He knew what he wanted. He wanted to get what he called one piece flow. And the fact that he was just filled up with merchandise. I went to Ozerbeele back in 1980 because I was going to go to Japan in 1981. And I wanted to compare American manufacturing with Japanese manufacturing. Because I didn't know anything about manufacturing. I was in data processing, not in manufacturing. And I went to Ozerbeele and they had a thousand of everything on the factory floor. They had a thousand engines. A th you just visualize the car. A thousand of everything. This was a funny day. And I'm walking along and I'm seeing one man smoking a cigarette and he's putting into the car brake fluid. And that's all. And I said, how could a human being just do that? It was crazy. And I said, is that all he does? And he said, I don't know, but we had one man in the plant. He's been here for 47 years and all he has done is pick up a tire and put it on a hook. That was his job. And it moved it to the line. And the irony of this story is the man retired and two weeks later he died. You, all of the excitement went out of life. <laughs> Just putting the hook. Now what Ono did, <laughs> which, which was amazing, and we'll talk a lot about Ono and Shingle tonight because they're the creators of Lean. Ono would come to the factory and nobody does it that I know of. We're talking about being Lean, but I know nobody does this. Never came feedback to me. Ono would go out and he see, here's a department with eight people in it. Eight people are working in that department. And Ono would say to them, I want you to do it with five. I want you to take whatever the eight people are doing, and I want five people to do the work. And he walked away. He never told them how to do it. He didn't even tell them why he wanted it. It was obvious if we can be more efficient with five than eight. But he knew the following, if I didn't demand from them, and he had the power to ask because you couldn't say no to Ono. He was the senior vice president of all manufacturing at Toyota. So you couldn't say no to him, really. And, and, but Ono would ask for the impossible always because he didn't know what you can do unless he asked you. So we run our companies, right? And we see 10 people and all the 10 people are busy and we allow the 10 people to do what they continually do. Ono wouldn't do that. One day, he stands in front of a, um, a warehouse at Toyota Gosei. Toyota Gosei is a major supplier to, to Toyota. And he looks at the warehouse, and he says, you know, to the managers, at Toyota, we have no warehouse. No warehouse at Toyota. So he said to the president of Toyota Gosei, I want you to get rid of the warehouse. I want you to retrain everybody to be a mechanic, and we'll make it into a machine shop, and I'll give you one year to do it. And he walked away. And one year later, it was a machine shop, and the warehouse went away. It's amazing. That's what lean is. We're running about doing lean. And lean is only a couple of things that I'll give you. Really, only, only one. One is you command to be the most efficient, the most effective organization in the world. And that's what Toyota is today, pretty close to that. I mean, there are other ones that I like even a little bit better. We can talk about that, too. The other one was... Shingo, and then I'll come back to, um, I'm 85, so I lose the train of thought occasionally, and you can bring me back when, when this happens. <laughs> Shingo did one other thing, and this is the essence of lean. One is you command to be lean. You ask people to do the impossible. Ask them to do the impossible. Don't tell them how to do it because you're taking away their creativity. You want everybody in your organization 
to be self-reliant. That's another key word. Everybody in your company should be self-reliant. I published a marvelous book called The Happiest Company to Work For. I think you only have one copy here to buy, but it's great. The ca ha and it's about a, it was written by the president of a company called Mirai in Japan. And he had, there was only one question, and I, I do this. <laughs> it's called No Horenzo. He has a principle called No Hor Horenzo means spinach in Japanese. And I never like spinach, and I guess he never liked spinach. So he said, we can have no spinach in the company. What is spinach? What is horenzo? Well, horenzo really represents, if you want to do something, do it. Never ask your boss for permission. Imagine that. I've never heard that in an American company. Never. America's top down. Authority comes from the top. They tell you what to do as if they know what to do. They know how to make profit. You can't deny that. American companies are making a lot of profits. I have to be careful. He says, I can't wander. <laughs> so I'll try to come That's back okay. now. Sorry, I'm wondering. It's interesting so far. We'll try to come back now to Shingo. Shingo did one thing marvelous. I mean, many things. He's a great author. You should read all of Shingo's books if you're really seriously interested in being lean because he's the authority. And Shingo, one day I'm working in a plant, Dresser Industries, and they're making the, the gasoline station, you know, the pumps. They make most of, a lot of those pumps. Uh, we went through their, their plant where they were making those pumps. And we were watching one man, who was a man this time, and he was running a punch press and picking up a piece of metal on the left, putting it on the bed, moving it into the press, then putting his two hands on the two buttons because we don't want the person to lose their hands, right? But we don't worry about people losing their head, their mind. Look at the work that we give people. But we worry about the hands, not the head. We'll talk more about respect for people that's the second part of the question. Or the f yeah. I think you've done a good job covering it so far. Okay, we'll come into respect for people. So Shingo, then they put it, then he, when the press came up, the press goes down and stamps the metal, and then it comes up, he reached into the bed, pulls out the metal, and puts it over on the side. And then he does another one. And Shingo always walked around with a stopwatch. Every manager should always have a stopwatch. Automatically carry a stopwatch to clock people, to clock operations, to see how efficient you are and are you really getting, you talk about continuous improvement, but very rarely is it ever measured that we're continuous improvement. And then Shingo turns to the engineers around him and he says the following, what is the value adding ratio? That's a key question to ask. What is the value adding ratio? What is adding value in this operation? And the balance is what we call waste. And that's the essence of what lean is, is the elimination of all the non-manufacturing waste. And there are seven classic wastes, then I added two. <laughs> I'm pretty proud of those two. What's the second one? I know the first one's people. I was actually, that's going to be my next question. So this is well, the first one, the, 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 one, the eighth waste that I asked is the underutilization of people's talent. People come to work and you don't demand of them and so they don't grow. And that's like having a, a, you know, any kind of vegetable. You have to feed it. You have to encourage it to develop itself to grow. And we, people join our companies and we see they're doing a good job, leave them alone. Well, Shingo asked these engineers, what's the value adding ratio? And one engineer said, 100%. He's working all the time. He's always adding value. Another engineer said 75%. Another engineer said 50%. What do you think Shingo said? Very close, 17%. It's only when the blade, only when the press stamps the metal are you ask adding value. This is the brilliance of Ono and Shingo to look at this. Because we run our companies and we don't, we're selling value. The customer is buying value, but we're selling them waste. We're selling them setup time. We're setting up wasted movement. We're, 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 we're selling them the transportation time. That doesn't add value. And that's what Ono came up with, these seven classic ways. And the last one, the ninth one that I like, is the manager's resistance to change. Manager's resistance to change. I've I call it that. the ninth waste. Now, I've been teaching people what I call the Harada Method, and you all should learn the Harada Method. It is, it is such a jewel. 80,000 people in Japan have been taught this. It teaches you how to pick a goal and how to attain your goal. It's a marvelous concept. 
And so I've been teaching it over Zoom. I started in June to teach it over Zoom.us. And that's what I do. I sit home and I have students all over the world. You name it and I have a student there somewhere that's learning from me on Zoom. I teach them one hour a week or one hour every, every other week. I teach them on Zoom. And so I'm teaching one student, the first student that I got back in June, and he works for an Alabama hospital. And I like him very much, and he's absorbing what I'm teaching. He's a lean manager for the hospital system. It's a very large hospital. And um, I say to him after a week, you know, you really should pay me something. Pay me something, anything. He says, well, in order for me to pay you anything, I have to ask the president of the hospital. This is a multi-million dollar hospital system, and he has to ask the, the president for permission to pay me something, anything. I didn't tell him what to pay me. I didn't know back then. And so he goes to the, I said, before you go to the president, call Joe Schwartz. Joe works, the, he has the same title as you, and he works for the Baptist, the Baptist healthcare system in Indianapolis. It's a large system, 7,000 people work there. And I taught them two things. I taught them what's called quick and easy Kaizen, which I taught Matt, and I, and I taught them the Harada system. Ask him what he saves. He went and talked to Joe, and, and he said, Joe, what did you save from Bodex teaching? And he said, well, maybe $1.5 million. Then I speak to a week later, a couple weeks later, I speak to Mark Graven. Mark Graven, I taught Quick and Easy Kaizen, and the two of them, Schwartz and Graven, wrote a book on Quick and Easy Kaizen in hospitals. It's really wonderful. And he says, no, they don't save $1.5 million in total. They save $1.5 million a year off what I taught, what I stole. You see, you don't know Norman, he's a cheater. I go to Japan and I steal. And that's the only way to learn. I went to school, I was the dumbest kid in class. I'm, I'm diverging a little bit. I was the dumbest kid in class, really, you know? And in the ninth grade, I just had a terrible memory. I'd go home and study and I'd take the test and I can't remember the answer. And I'm sitting there and Gary says, Norman, what's wrong? I said, Gary, I don't know what to do. I go home and do the homework. I come and take the test, and I fail. And Gary says, Norman, what I do, I had the same problem, but I go home, and when I get something I think is valuable, I write it on a sheet of paper, and I put the sheet of paper in my pocket, and then when I take the test, I look at the pocket. I said, Gary, it's a great idea. So I go, and I study, and I write down these key points, and I put it in my pocket. The first question I look at, I know that, but I can't remember. It won't pop out of my memory. So I go like this, and I look, and who do you think is there? The teacher caught me looking at the sheet of paper, and she looked at me, and she said, Norman, you are a cheater. Everybody in the class knew I was a cheater. She told every other teacher in the school that Norman is a cheater. He's a cheater. Now the thing is, who was I cheating? This whole school system is so screwed up. Who are you teach cheating by copying? Even if you're copying somebody else's paper, what's wrong with that? If you can prove that you are learning, that you are advancing your skill, that's, one, that's what education should be about, building skills on top of skills, not giving you all the nonsense. I'm sitting with a young, a friend of our daughter of a young friend, Felicia. She's a lovely girl. And I said, Felicia, what are you taking in school? She's about nine, nine, 10 years old. Well, they just taught us about Lewis and Clark. And isn't that wonderful, teaching us about Lewis and Clark? What are you going to do with that later in life? The, how many students graduate high school, graduate high school, and they got to work at McDonald's? They don't have a skill. How can you go through a school system with no skill? It's a crime. And the first thing we got to do is, the first thing we're going to do in Portland is get the homeless off the street. And the second thing we should do is change the educational system. Okay. I taught at Portland State University. Norman? Yes. I'm going to bring you back to the conversation. Yeah, let's go back to respect for people. Well, we were talking about your Zoom student. I've heard this story. I want you to finish it because it's a good one. So you're a Zoom student who worked at a hospital, who oh went and yeah. asked his boss. Oh, thank you very much. You're welcome. He's very good. So he works at the hospital. He goes to the president of the hospital and says, look, Norman wants me to pay him something. I like what he's teaching me. I think it's valuable for the, for the hospital. And the president said what? What do you think he said? What do you think he said? It's hard to say no. No, what did he say? No, no, what do you think he said? What is the typical senior executive going to say when you want money? 
No, they're not that smart. It's not in the budget. That's it, it's not in the budget. Nothing is in the budget. This is crazy. I saved the other hospital system 1.5 million a year, and he wouldn't, maybe offer me $10. I'd have to accept it because I said, give me anything. And this relates back to the, the ninth waste then, so Man the resistance to change. Resistance to change is horrible. So yeah. there's a company in, in Japan, Mirai, which is a wonderful company, and if you want to read about it, you can buy the book or you buy my new book. Now, I don't want to sell anything, but my new book is wonderful. <laughs> and, and I tell the story, I, I'm filled with 80 miracles. Believe it, I started out at the dumbest kid in school. The dumb, in the ninth grade, if you saw the yearbook, you see Norman Bodek. And underneath my name, it says, Norman Bodek is the most likely student to get ahead. Because he needs one. <laughs> That's in the yearbook. Then okay. she turns to my friend Monroe, and she says, Monroe, don't play with Norman because Norman's going to turn out to be a criminal. <laughs> and I look back in my life, and I wrote it down too. There are two things I did, three things I stole. One is I steal knowledge. And that's the only way to really learn is to steal knowledge. What we're missing in America is an apprenticeship system the way they have in Europe, especially in Germany. If you get, if you, in Germany, they'll take a young person, maybe 14, 15, bring them into a company, they'll work with a master. And then what do they do with the master? The master says, clean the floor. The master will not teach the student. That's the best learning, by the way. A teacher shouldn't teach a student. This is funny. A teacher should learn with the student, period. And so what does a master do? Clean the floor, clean the bathroom. That's your job. The student has to steal from the master. He has to watch it, then copy it. Go watch it and copy it. And then if the master is kind enough, he'll say, okay, I'll look and see what you did and look at it and see if it's any good or not. We don't have that program here, that master program. Now bring me back, because I just got lost. I think we're done for that question. But no, we, didn't, okay. we didn't attack respect for people. Okay. Let's, let's do that, because this is the important part I wanted to talk about, okay. is respect for people. What is respect for people? I want to I ask you two questions. I want to give you another question. What is lean? We'll talk about that. And what is respect for people? Because we don't know what lean is. Mm, it is, and yet it's a lot more. It's very, very powerful if we understand it. So what, is, what gives people, you, you are people, what gives you respect? Tell me, what gives you respect? What? Autonomy. Autonomy. Being, heard. Being heard. Very good. What gives you respect? Accomplishment. Accomplishment. Yes. What else? What? Action. Yeah, you got it. That's the key. The real key. Give people the opportunity to become a master, and that's respect. Give people the opportunity to build a skill, and that's respect. They should build a skill on top of a skill. I just read a well, I'm reading a wonderful book by Fernando Flores. Anybody know who Fernando Flores is? You do. Tell me, what do you know about him? He was amazing. He worked on communication skills, but he was a genius. What? Yeah, he's an amazing man. I mean, he was a politician in, in Chile. He left after Allende got overthrown. And then he became an amazing consultant. I loved him because he bought all my books. That's how I met him <laughs> years ago. But uh, I just, I'm just reading his book now, and that's what he, he's defining. Education really should be building skills on top of skills. And that's what you focus on. Help people become a master. And that's respect for people. Yeah, you give people a pat, pat on the back. That's nice. Too. You all should praise each other. That's part of my Harada, Harada method. In fact, before we leave tonight, let's stop at this moment and let's look at the person next to you. Look at the person next to you and praise them.
Okay. So. Every day you should praise five people, by the way. Don't let one day go by without praising five times, both at home and at work. It's a key. I could not praise when I was younger. My father never praised me, never praised me. My teachers never praised me. Look at my report cards. They, they never praised me. Then I go to work and I have a big company. I never praised anybody. The reason I didn't praise because I said to myself, I have to feel sincere. I have to feel that I really, I, I, it, it has to be sincere in me, then I can pray. But it never came. But then I said, said I'm a manager, I own a company. And I looked at one young lady and I happened to dance with her. She was gorgeous and she was a data entry operator. And I looked at her and I said, I want to thank you for doing such a great job on that Bud Budweiser work. It was wonderful. And it was so hard for me because I didn't really feel sincere about it. She stopped, looked up at me, and the love that poured out of that woman, the love that came out of her heart, it melted me. I started to cry. And I realized it was a great lesson. You'll read it in my book. It's a, it's a <laughs> don't forget that, it's a joke. It's a great lesson in life is you don't have to get it up front. You can get it later. That means give and you'll get it back. But even better, give and don't worry about getting it back. Just give. Okay. Sorry, you can keep the microphone. I got another one here. <laughs> um, I want to open it up to the audience who has a question ready. Okay, do you want to come to the microphone? And I want to just say this one thing. Everybody has a sheet of paper. You should have a sheet of paper, and it has my email address, and the price of admission is a question. So if you don't ask it tonight, you must send me a question, or else you're cheating, and only Norman gets away with cheating. <laughs> so my question is, there's all these people that are here right now, but there are so many people out there who aren't here. Have you ever gone into why it's such a fight to get managers to embrace change, or why isn't it just the default that we do lean It's a thinking? wonderful question, you know, because managers resist change. They're afraid if they make a mistake, they're going to lose their job. It's a heck of a crazy system. That's why the Japanese were so smart in having a lifetime employment system. It's changing a little bit now. There's a vast part-time labor group in Japan. Um, but um, bring back your question. Why isn't it prolific out there? Why isn't it prolific out there? It, it, it is confusing. W our whole educational system is so messed up. That's one of the main reasons. Do you know? And we're not demanding here the best. We're, we're focused on the wrong things. Today in America, I don't want to be too political. I don't want to talk about Trump. <laughs> I'd love to, but I'm not going to talk about Trump. <laughs> Am I getting in trouble? <laughs> but um, where was I? Come on, bring me back. Why aren't people coming to lean in droves? Why aren't managers using this? Why, why isn't change part of the... Yeah, why, 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 why isn't manageable? Yeah, thank you. America, the enormous pressure today is on making profits. If I make profits in a large corporation, and most of America is owned by the large corporation today, we don't have Theodore Roosevelt, uh, you know, running the country. We don't have the first President Roosevelt to break up the monopolies, to break up the monopolies at all. So these corporations are focused on profit. I was told that in the top 500 companies in the in in America today, the average compensation is 10 million dollars. So their focus is on profit, but profit is not a measure of success in the long term. Productivity is. You can manipulate, I, I graduated as an accountant, and you could manipulate profits so easy. I mean, one thing about profits, which is so funny from the accountants, at the end of the year, everybody tries to make as much as you can because the accountants came up with something really crazy. If you build up inventory, it increases your profit. Even though you didn't sell it, you're making money. Well, that's nuts. So General Motors would build up their, make as many automobiles as they can in the last couple of months of the year, and then they give big discounts at the beginning of the year, and General Motors went bankrupt. I mean, General Motors never learned lean. 
Toyota opened up a joint venture called Numi in Fremont, California, and because they were afraid to come to America. They didn't know if they were going to be accepted. So they said to Ford, let me teach you lean, or let me teach you the Toyota production system, and Ford said, no, we're not interested. And then they went to General Motors and said, General Motors, yeah, you can teach us. They took the worst plant in the system. General Motors had about 200 plants. They took the one plant that was closed because the union was so terrible, so bad, she said, well, you can take that plant. Toyota took it. One year later, it was the best plant in all of General Motors. It took them one year to take the worst plant to make the best plant. Just one year. And General Motors never knew how to take it from that one plant and transfer it anywhere else and went bankrupt. I think a key point as well in that is that they hired back the same people that were making it the worst plant. Yes. So Toyota approved that it wasn't about the people. It was about the process. Right. They're um, all the union people. And there's a fantastic podcast that. about this. Uh, it's a This American Life podcast that you can find. Just look up New Me, This American Life, and you'll find it. It's really, really good. So why isn't it prolific? Well, the system is a little bit messed up now. And the senior people don't really understand the power of lean or what Toyota did. And so what is lean today primarily? Well, no, that's the next question. <laughs> Actually, you just said the senior people don't understand the power of lean, do you think sometimes they're uh, threatened by it? No, I don't know the threat. Th they're misusing it. You know, one of my clients was Jake Brake, back when I, when I owned Productivity. I sold that 20 years ago. Jake Brake, I brought over these two Japanese that I mentioned, Ono's assistants. They asked me to help them. They were leaving Toyota and said, would I help them get set up in America? And I did. And we ran an event called Five Days in One Night. Somebody changed the name to call it Kaizen Blitz. And this company was owned by Danaher. At the time, Danaher had $2 billion in sales. And they learned the Kaizen Blitz. You go in and we arranged, rearranged the whole, f we moved 50 machines in one week. They, I attracted 50 people, I paid them five, charged them $5,000 each, and I had no idea what we was doing. But, but they listened to me back then. That, they don't listen to me now, but back then they listened to me. And they paid for, and we rearranged that. It was so powerful that inventory went down enormously. And also, they didn't need as many people. So what did Danaher do? By getting rid of the inventory, they, they ended up with cash. By laying off people, we got more cash. So they took the cash and bought another company, and bought another company. They went from $2 billion to $20 billion. They owned Tektronix, as an example. They took this one event. Now, the terrible thing is this, is when the people came over here, they said, Norman, we have to get people to agree that they're not gonna lay anybody off from this event. So the first people that I taught all agreed, but they cheated because they did lay off people. And so very often lean is called mean, lean and mean, because the result is getting rid of people. But Toyota doesn't get rid of people, never, never. I mean, if you're really a terrible worker at Toyota, you're really bad, what do you think they do with you? No, they don't do that. They, what? They try to train you, but if they can't train you, they put you in a corner, they make you sit in a seat and look at the wall, and that's your job, and they'll pay you until you eventually quit. <laughs> but they don't, it, do, it rarely happens because it's in Japan, you should write that down, right? You're, you're really part of a team. Everybody is part of a team, a very strong team. And how many teams do we have in America? And why don't we have teams in America? The first thing I found in 1981, 80, was quality control circles. I thought quality control circles was a secret to the Japanese success. That's what I thought at first before I went to Japan. So I started to write about it, started to teach quality control circles. It's wonderful. You get five to eight people together, workers that work together, and you have them address major quality problems. They pick the problem, you approve it if you're a manager. And they're normally major. Maybe they'll spend, maybe they'll only have two or three projects a year, because the workers do this on their own time. But they're taught the fundamental skills of the quality manager. So I had a client once in, in AFCO Corporation, AFCO Lycomi, and they had a sole source contract with the US Army to make engines for tanks. 
and they were running into trouble because the tanks were failing in Europe. And so they were coming back to AFCO, something's wrong with your engines. So AFCO had a quality problem. What do you think they did to solve the quality problem? What do you think they did? The first thing that they did, what do you think? Of course, they fired the quality manager. The first thing it did is to fire the quality manager. We're not getting quality. What the Japanese did, though, is they took the quality tools away from the manager and taught it to every single worker in their quality control. So the seven basic tools and the seven advanced tools. I'm very lucky. I found those and I published those books when I had productivity. I have one magic in my life, one major magic, and that's discovering the great talent that exists in the world of manufacturing, the world of, of management. That's my talent. I would go to Japan. I knew nothing about manufacturing, really. And I'd go to Japan, and I'd meet one great person that I met in my first trip. And I found out you know, what the person read. Actually, the first trip, I met Ryuji Fukuda, and he wrote a book. And I said to Fukuda, I want to publish your book in English. I had no idea, because I never published a book before. Are you OK, sweetie? No, the one behind you. Yeah, you're drifting. You can't do that in class. <laughs> You've got to keep your mind right here. I get I put more attention on here. You're not allowed to do that. I've been watching the people in front, but I've got to watch everybody. <laughs> huh. OK, where were we? <laughs> Fakuda, yes. Yeah, so I published Fakuda. That was my first book that I did. And then after that, I just went back. I can't speak Japanese. I still, I've been there 89 times. I'm going back to the 90th trip. I married Japanese. My wife is a Japanese. She's a doctor. She's, one, she's an acupuncturist, if you really want a good acupuncturist. She's a wonderful doctor. Look at me. I'm 85 years old. Right. Thank you. <laughs> OK. Next let's question. Let's do another question. Anybody got another question from the audience? Yeah, let's get another question. Come on, you all have to give a question or you're cheating. Yes. What's your name? Hi, my name's Karen, like a car. Hi, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have two questions, and I think the most relevant is, um, what's the appropriate amount of energy to put into evaluating risk management when you implement changes so that you don't have adverse, or you limit adverse effects of change? Yeah, of course you do. I mean, you can't make a bomb and put it in a car. I mean, you, you have to be careful careful what you, what you do. But we shouldn't allow risk aversion inhibit us from what we're trying to accomplish. So when you talk about energy, yes, you have to be careful that you don't give people poison. Do you know what I mean? That you give them the product, you, gotta give, you want to give people what they're really buying. So you have, in that sense, you have risk, risk aversion. But don't let it get in the way of you being successful in the company. Don't use it as an excuse. It's too, you know what I mean? Before you test it. Give it a chance to test as long as it doesn't kill somebody. Next question. Matt, I think you had a question, right? OK. And thank you, Matt. Yeah, thanks, Norman. So a lot of people are looking for help nowadays in lean. Um, and there are some big names from Japan, like Shingo Jitsu, which I understand is... From That's Japan. the company I just mentioned. Is it? So yeah. I wanted to ask you what, a, what you'd look for in getting good lean help. Well, let's tell you what Shinji Jitsu does. I mean, they have the most powerful. They had the most powerful because Ono picked... This is what we don't do in America. Ono picked 10 people. He took about 10 years or so to do just in time at Toyota. Then he had to go out to the suppliers. So he went out to the 10 top major suppliers. Nippon Denso, uh, Taiho Kogyo, the, the top 10 suppliers in Psyche. And he got one person from each of those companies. He took one person from each company and he put them into a team. He put them into a team. And they worked together to learn together. Ono would teach them and Shingo would spend at least one or two days a month just with that team. Teach, because Shingo was the greatest engineer, the greatest problem solver in the world the last, the last hundred years anyway. And um, they would put him into a team. And I met, I was connected to almost everybody in that team. It's a miracle in my life. The two that I mentioned were part of those team. They came over here and started a company called Shinji Jitsu. 
I wanted to be a partner, but they wouldn't let me be a partner with them. Even though I brought them here and made them successful, I have a lot of negative stories, and I don't want to bring them up <laughs> with them. But they're an amazing too. And the cow, I think, has an office in Portland. The cow was at one time probably the best lean consultant in the world. He went to Boeing and taught them lean. I tried to teach Boeing lean, but they wouldn't listen to me. But they, they brought in the cow. I tried to bring the cow into Boeing, and Boeing wouldn't listen. But a couple of years later, John Black, who I taught, got a hold of the cow and brought him into Boeing. And he taught them what the fundamentals of lean is all about, is eliminating those wastes. That's it, eliminating the wastes. I added two more, but eliminating the waste. All of you should know what the wastes are, and you attack them. So one waste is transportation. Transportation is moving things. So if you make it an airplane, there's lots of transportation. In fact, a lot of the Boeing aircraft is made overseas in Japan or China today. That's a lot of transportation to bring them back. What Nikau would do is he'd move everything close to the airplane. So if they were making something uh, across the street somewhere, you got to move it as close to the airplane as you can. He attacked those wastes. You should really learn what those wastes are, and you go after them ruthlessly, ruthlessly. Um, you yeah. mentioned just now Boeing, and I have a good friend that works for Boeing, um, and I had a very long conversation with her one night because she had heard of Lean, because Boeing does Lean, uh, and she was actually representing the union, and she was the kind of the middle person between the union and management. And we had a really long conversation, and what we were basically getting at was that maybe it's not really possible to fully implement Lean when you have union versus management. Yeah, Do you have yeah. any experience with that? Yeah, this is very good. First of all, I'm teaching Boeing next week. I'm very happy. I'm teaching them three days what I call the Harada Method. He, and the nice thing is, I don't have to go up to Renton. They're coming down to Vancouver, staying at the Hilton, and I'm going to teach them. And you should do the same thing. How many of you in a big company, how many of you in a company have more than 25 people? Raise your hand. A few of them. Well, you should bring me in. <laughs> or uh, even better, there are people here that I should teach. I taught Matt Quick and Easy Kinds, and Matt should learn the Harada Method, and then he could go and teach you. That would be very good. Now let's come back to your question, which is the union. Yes, unions reflect management. Management hates unions. Union is going to hate management. If management would turn it around the way Toyota did, begin to love thy neighbor as thyself, and begin to really love the union, the union would reflect that back. Management is terrified of workers getting together in America, and they've done everything to belittle the union. We used to have, what, 20, 25% of American workers were unionized. It's probably less than 5% today because management hates, hates the idea of people being organized because manage I had my own company. I wanted to run my own company. I don't want somebody else to tell me how to run my, own, m run my company. My employees couldn't tell me. In fact, when I ran Productivity Press, I solved all the problems. All of them. Just ask the people that work for me. I thought we'd have somebody here because I used to have productivity here, but nobody showed up from productivity today. I don't know what that means. Well, that was the old Norman. The new Norman is, is totally different. So the, 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 the problem with you, <laughs> nothing's wrong with the union. It's the way they interact with each other. And if they would just learn to love each other and change, get a common goal, what we're all about, in Japan, all of the major corporations have unions, but the unions, see, the one distinction in America is we're, comp we're industry unions. Japan, they're company unions. So if the company union goes out on strike, they can lose the company and, and all the workers lose their jobs. So they don't go out and strike. They wear a black band instead of, instead of stopping, stopping work. Here, since they're industry unions, we can close one company down as long as the whole industry is satisfied, if that makes, that makes sense to you, because your head is spinning a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Come on, ask another question. I'm having fun. I you hope have you are. Another question? Yes. Okay. Rusty. What is your favorite lean tool and why? 
my favorite lean tool, this is kind of funny, you know, because I taught Portland State University, and primarily I taught the Harada method to the students, and I taught them 33 lean tools. I accumulated 33 lean tools. Where? Because I published hundreds of books on the subject. The main focal point of productivity was the Japanese books, and the main Japanese books were on Toyota. And so I learned slowly. The first one I learned is quality control circles, then I learned Kanban. And so that became a tool. Then I learned visual management. I'm sorry Gwen is not here because she used to work with me, and she's probably the one of the top people in the world teaching visual management. It's very important to know what things are, and they're totally organized. And I have a good friend, Paul Akers, who knows Paul Akers in the room? Raise your hand. Paul Akers. Isn't that amazing? You don't know Paul Akers? He's the th number three. Wow. I just read something today of American influ influencers. Those people that influence our thinking. Paul is number three in America. And nobody knows Has him. Has anybody heard Two Second Lean? Okay, that's Paul, Paul, Akers. Paul Akers wrote Two Second Lean. Everybody should read Two Second Lean if you're interested in lean because he took my quick and easy Kaizen. He stole it. He's a good stealer. <laughs> he stole quick and easy Kaizen, which is the Japanese suggestion system, and instead of working on a project to get the project done, he says every day every worker should come up with something to improve their productivity by two seconds. That's all. Improve your work by two seconds. In Quick and Easy Kaizen, I taught people to take a picture before and after. Show the problem before and take a picture after. It's in my book. Well, the, the world has changed since I wrote the book. It's changed a lot. Now we have the iPhone. Everybody can take a picture. Everybody can take a video. We couldn't do it back then. I didn't upgrade my, up, update my book, but Paul did. And so the worker now takes a video of the problem makes the correct makes the the improvement and then takes another video and they put it on YouTube. So if you go to FastCap, that's Paul Aker's company, F A S T C A P, you'll see thousands of videos created by Paul and created by the workers. I've Paul is a wonderful man. I mean, I, I, he somehow he adopted me as his as his father recently and he traveled with me in India, traveled me th went to Bar Grenada with him, went to Japan <laughs> did Japan with him. He's an amazing man. And he taught me something wonderful, really grateful. He said, Norman, you weigh too much. He said, uh, give up sugar. No more sugar. He said, give up carbohydrates. No more bread. No more cake. No more pasta. Give it up. Don't eat it. I don't eat nothing that comes out of a box. Eat nothing that comes out of a can. And I had a can of tuna fish once, and I almost died. So that's good advice. <laughs> I, <laughs> I followed Paul's advice, and I lost about 15 pounds. I met Paul in Japan one month ago, spent another, another time with him. He came and visited me. My, my wife has a house in, in Japan. He came and spent some time with me, and he said, Norman, I'm now on a 16-hour fast every day. I don't leave for 16 hours. So today... I don't eat from, I cheat a little bit because I had a grape, but I am a cheater. <laughs> Just ask my teachers. So, but I don't eat normally from 6 o'clock at night till 10 o'clock in the morning. And I lost another 10 pounds. It's amazing. So the irony, the wonderful thing of this, when I was 37, I gave up smoking and gained 25 pounds. I just ballooned up. To substitute for the cigarette, I had to have something in my mouth, so I ate. And now I'm back to the same weight I was when I was 37. Okay, next question. Thank you. Just do the mic so we can record it. I'm glad you have questions because I brought slides just in case you didn't have questions. I was going to put up the slides and talk about things. So you mentioned some of the great tools. Um, what about tools that are specific for really small operations? Well, I don't like the idea, even though I taught it at college, I don't like the idea of being tool focused. I like you to get an understanding clearly that lean is the elimination of waste. Lean is respect for people. Lean is develop, a manager's job is to solely develop people. Top management's job is to create the vision where the boat is going so you know where the company is going. 
But middle management's job is solely to develop the people they're working for. In fact, if a middle manager was smart, he would work or she would work themselves out of a job. Make everybody self-reliant like at Mirai. They're, they're all self-reliant. They can't ask their boss for permission. It's a, wonderful, it's a wonderful management style to get people to really be very strong. So a tool. Well, people are using value stream mapping, right? They're, they're using, uh, I don't know, there are 33 tools. Send me an email, I'll give you the list of tools. But you shouldn't, you shouldn't be tool-oriented. You should be eliminating the waste-oriented. It's much easier. There's only nine, nine wastes instead of 33 tools to worry about, right? You attack motion. We know that motion is a waste. But I have yet to find anybody in America attacking motion. I don't do. I don't see it. You do. What? Yeah, I mean that's the ultimate objective, of course, to get a one-piece flow. It all happened with oh no. Oh no, two things. Got to come back to the word flow. But I said to Ono once, how did you learn just in time? And he laughed. He said, I learned it from Henry Ford. I read Henry Ford's book, Today and Tomorrow. So I came back from Japan. I, I lived in Connecticut. I called the Greenwich Library, which is one of the best libraries in the world. And I said to the librarian, can you get me a copy of the Henry Ford book, Today and Tomorrow? And I read it. It was wonderful. I called Doubleday. I said, I want the rights to reprint it, and I'll give you a 10% royalty. I didn't have to give him anything because it was out of royalty. I wasn't too smart. But I sold 35,000 copies of that book at $35 a book. Ono gave me a gift of $1 million. Because it didn't cost anything to print the book. There's no editing, nothing. You just take, take the book and, and we printed it. Now Ono did focus on flow. Ono was so far, Toyota was so far behind American companies. He was trying to figure out, how do I catch up? And he discovered that the American supermarket, he said when Mrs. Housewife, because back then Mrs. House, the housewife did the shopping. Today I do the shopping. <laughs> I'm married to a doctor. But the, the, the housewife goes to the Safeway and takes off 10 items. And what does the supermarket do? What do they do? They put it back as fast as they can. That's the job of the supermarket system today because there's very little shelf space. They have 50,000 different items in the store, very little space for, except Coca-Cola, of course. They got lots of space. They have lots of power. Anyway, Ono thought, why can't I do that in manufacturing? Why can't I come up with a system? He mentions flow. How can I get a system that eliminates all of this inventory. Remember, General Motors had a thousand of everything. Toyota had the same thing prior to Ono. The factory was, because they copied. What the Japanese did, I'm bouncing all over, but what the Japanese did at the end of World War II is they came here to learn from America, and we opened our arms and our hearts to them. We really did. We opened our, we let them come into our factories, and they came in there, and they were so grateful. They all had cameras. And they would say to the manager, can we take your picture? And the manager says, of course you can take my picture. So the manager's standing there very proud, full, you know, with a smile on his face. And then they said, could you move over just a little bit? Because <laughs> they wanted the machine. They wanted the technology, and they took it back to Japan. And they copied it 100%, and then they improved it, improved it, improved it. And it puts us to shame how far ahead they are with the technology they took from us. We invented robots. I don't know if there's an American company really making robots. And when I was in Japan, maybe 100 companies were making robots. They learned robotics, and then they said, why can't we make our own? And they made, made their own. I should have been a billionaire. I was told in India that I should have been the richest man in the world, but I'm not that smart. I should have been the richest man in the world. I went to Japan on my first trip, and I met Fujitsu Phonic. It fascinated me. First robot manufacturer in Japan. And they took me to one of their plants, and robots were making robots. This is back in 1980, some robots, the, the factory, the lights were off because robots don't need lights. They only had one engineer sitting in the computer room. What an amazing, and I didn't buy stock in the company. 
It's it's crazy what I've done. <laughs> but yes, please, thank you. Now, I'm not doing what I really I'm talking a lot, but I'm not giving you things that you specifically should be applying to do to be lean. That's what we should be addressing now. What can you really do to be a lean company? What can you do to be really a lean consultant? Yes. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> that's not part of my question because I think it's, I've been trying to figure out how to ask this. So what you were just talking about was automation. And right now it feels like uh, societally we're talking a lot about innovation. And in the past, innovation has led to more automation, what has which has led to more joblessness, which probably has led to more homelessness. And so I guess I'm just trying to reconcile these two things around um, efficiency and productivity and this move towards innovation and automation, whether it's self-driving cars or Amazon taking over Whole Foods or whatever it is, all of these are jobs. Um, and I know the key part of lean is to not necessarily cut jobs, but that seems like part of this big movement towards innovation and automation. And I'm just curious. Okay, so one wonderful, that. wonderful question to address. What's your name? Kelly, wonderful question, because it's a very important question. It is. Progress should not be stopped. No. If, we, if automation is going to reduce the labor, then we bring in automation. Why? Because 90% of what labor does today stinks. That's no job to give a human being what you give them to do. They, they're, they're, they're extensions of those machines. That's why you can, that's why you can automate it. What are they doing? They're doing this. We, we, we have an assembly line. We have a tack time of two minutes, and the work in that two minutes does the same thing over and over again. They work on 300 cars today. They do the same thing on the 300 cars. When I first went to Toyota, that's what they did. Then they changed, because Georgetown in America, they demanded different. So every two hours, they changed, they changed the work and gave them something different to do every two hours. So in Japan, every two hours the work gets something new to do. But it's still like a robot. But this is a question. That's why we gotta go back to focusing on everybody to become a master. Japan has something I wish we had here. Maybe you can start it. They have what's called living masters, living treasures. So they pick the top artisan of every skill in Japan, maybe 30 or 40 different skills. Knife make. Who's the best knife maker in Japan and that's honored? I went to a plate manufacturer because I love to buy these Portland plates. And the plate is a brand new plate. They're asking $2,500 for the plate because it comes from a living master. We focus on mastery. And we don't worry. We don't want to retain progress. And people are better being, it's better to pay the people not to work than to have them do some of the useless work that we, we have them do. We should send them back to school. Do what Roosevelt said, the second Roosevelt. He set up the WPA and, and millions of people were taught how to work. Taught skills. I mean, go to Mount Hood. That was made by the WPA um, during the 30s. Yes. And the homeless, we can address the homeless if we're really serious about it. Yes, we can get rid of this homeless. And when I was younger, there was no such thing as homeless. There was a couple of bums on the Bowery in New York City, but that was it. And now Portland has something like, like 7,000 people homeless. It's insane. It's cruel. How can you love your neighbors as, as themselves? Rudy was a great teacher. If you read my new book, every chapter has a saying by Rudy. He was a great yoga teacher, great master. I studied with him for two years, and he died in a plane crash. But one day, Rudy is out there in New York City. That's where he had his ashram, his teaching institute. He was also the world's largest oriental antique dealer, both. And one day, a bum comes by to Rudy, and he says, um, I'm hungry. Can you give me some money for food? And Rudy said, no. And one of his students said, how can you turn him away? So Rudy says, okay, you're right. So he goes back to the bum and says, you're hungry? I'll take you into my house and I'll cook you a meal for lunch. How many people would do that with a bum? And the bum said, no, I don't really want food. All I want is money for a drink. Yeah, it's interesting. This whole homeless issue, we have to focus on skill development, real skill development. 
and w there's a way to do it in Portland. It's so easy, so easy. All we need is the Portland community to get together, the companies to get together, and we set up an insurance fund. Every, ins every company, depending upon the number of employees, gives money to this fund. So if you have 20 employees the way, the way you have at this company, you would pay, I don't know, $500 an employee, something that you can afford, and it will go into this fund, insurance fund. And then you would hire a homeless person. You would hire an ex-criminal. You'd get them to swear that they're not going to steal again. But if they do steal, the insurance would pay your loss. Simple as that. And we start to get rid of these homeless. And they, but you have to be committed to train them, to give them an opportunity. Let them start. Let them sweep the floor. It doesn't matter where you start. So my question actually relates to mastery and yes. kind of middle management, how you kind of expand upon people. So how do you encourage uh, people to actually grow their own skills instead of kind of just completing their job to a bare minimum as kind of the normal culture in American workplaces as we kind of have? Yeah, that's, that's a challenge for a manager because a manager's job is to develop people, but they don't do their job. They don't focus on developing people and, and fostering them to build their skills and capabilities. I love the Harada method. I discovered it seven years ago. I had four students ask me to intern when I was teaching at Portland State, and I didn't know what to do with them. I knew what interning was, but I didn't know what, I didn't want to say no. So I had a friend in Japan, Nakamura, one of my past authors, and he created something called a map. Incredible instrument, this map. This map, anyway, I, I, if you want a copy, I'll send you the map. It's an incredible in instrument how to have a really great company. And so each week we'd look at this map. It would show one of the great, what's the, it'd break up the company into 30 areas, like quality, like maintenance, like training. And then it would say, what technique in the world is the best in quality? What's the best, tec what's the best technique in the world in quality? Give me, what are some of the best quality techniques today? Control chart, that's just part of it. What's, what's some of the great techniques? That's it. Statistical product. What else? That's very good, too. What else? Come on. What are the great tools to get quality? Standard work. What? That's, that's, that they're all good, but they're part of the seven basic tools. I want to go up a little bit. Six Sigma is one. Wonderful. And another one. Quality. Quality control management, what do they call it? Quality control management or TQM, total management, con TQ, or TM, whatever it's called. <laughs> That's it, total quality. Ma in Japan, they told it qu total quality control, but we didn't like the word control, so we got rid of it in America. Same thing. Yeah. You teach. I just got lost in thought. Why did I go there? No, beyond, oh yeah, I'm teaching these students, and then, thank you, you're very good. And we come to the seventh week, he's teaching us once a week, once every other week in Japan over Skype, and it says standard work. And then it said the best technique in the world is called day-to-day -day management. Day-to-day -day management is the best technique to get standard work. And then they said, what, is the, what company, who's doing it? And it said Takashi Hirata. So it said Takashi, I said, who is Tashi Karada? He's somebody that teaches day-to-day -day management in Japan. He's taught 80,000 people. So what I do, because this is what I do, is I said to my wife, she's Japanese, see if he wrote any books. He wrote seven books. We bought all seven books. And I was very lucky because three of my four students knew Japanese. So they read the books for me. I got so excited. I picked up the phone through my wife because he doesn't speak English. I don't speak Japanese. And I said, Mr. Harada, I want to bring your work to America because that's what I do. I, p I publish Japanese books and I bring them to America. And I said, I want to go to Japan to meet you. And I did. I got on a plain business class because at my age, I only go business class. And I go to meet him. This is a funny story. I go to meet him and uh, I say, I want to publish one of your books. Which book can I take? Because that's what I do. I take one of their books, translate it, and publish it here. He says, no, nope, I don't want to give you one of my old books. I said, I just flew from America to meet you to get one of your books and you tell me I can't have one? He says, no, I want to write a new one. 
And then I said something I should have said to Shingo and Ono 30 years before. I wasn't that smart. So many things I didn't do. I said to Harada, I want to co-write the book with you. Because now I'm starting to write books. I've written seven books. Co-write it with you. He said, okay, and I did. I co-wrote the book with him. He sent me 100 pages, and I added another 250 pages. I try to Americanize it. I try to take what he's interpreting, how we could use his work here in America. And I published his book. Thank you. I don't know if I ever asked you a question, but go ahead. I actually have a question yes. um, that kind of came to me. When you mentioned about the unions, you mentioned that in Japan, they, they love the unions and they work with them. And then I didn't say love. I said they accept the union. You used the word love. I did use love. They love people. Okay. <laughs> love thy neighbor as thyself. But, but they accept the union, but mm -hmm. the union... Go ahead. Well, my point was on the word love because you used it several times. Maybe it wasn't in that context, but it was definitely talking about that. Um, that is something that like, is very difficult to talk about in the work environment, obviously. Well, I, I, what I'm saying, in Japan, unions are with every major corporation, mm -hmm. and they work in, they try to express the values of the workers with senior management, they do, and they're cooperative, they're not belligerent, they don't close the company down, but they do demand an increase. We want 10% raise this year. They'll tell that to management. And that's wonderful because when you force management to give the worker more money, you're forcing managers to be more efficient in their organization to make the money to pay the worker. We look at it negative here. It's not negative to pay people more money. That's why the CEO gets $10 million a year. So unions play an effective role representing the interests of the worker. But the manager also represents the interest of the worker. They do, with their respect for people. So how do you get managers here to care without talking about? I don't know. Tell them to go to church on Sunday. <laughs> I mean, how do you run these companies the way we do, why we want to control people the way we do? That's not to be a manager. Your job is to develop people, make them stronger than you. But our teaching system is the same thing. What teacher wants the student to be smarter than them? It doesn't happen. The teachers are smart. They're paid to be smart. And they're paid to grade you. Terrible. Why do we grade people? Terrible grading you. Stupid to grade people. Can you apply the knowledge in your life is the only criteria that education should be about. Are you building a skill? Can you make a desk? Can you cook? Can you plaster a wall? Can you do things do you know that you can make a living? Then you got a good education. But you graduate high school, and you were kind of... I had seniors in my class at Portland State. They were seniors, and it was pitiful that they're graduating with the skill level that they have. It was terrible. Portland State, I have to be careful. They might sue me, but they're stealing. They're taking from these children and not giving them the fundamental skills. They give them a diploma, and industry says, well, at least they got a diploma that's better than no diploma. And so they give you a job. But what do you really know? Where were we? I think I, we have another question there. Thank you. But I want the question, let's, if we can go back that you do something, I'm going to teach you something if you'd like. I'll teach you how to meditate if you like. Go ahead. Um. So throughout the presentation, you've talked about books, um, and I just wanted to, I'm curious, what are your like top three to five favorite books out there related to lean or productivity, management? Okay. And they can't be on that table over there. The or movie can't be <laughs> on the, the table. You've written. <laughs> okay. I do like the books that I've written. <laughs> Mostly on the quick and easy Kaizen, but there's Kaikaku, the book that I got the Shingo Prize for. And that's primarily what I learned in Japan. The best books should come from the originators. Why do you go to somebody? Like, if you could read Japanese, you should read Harada's book. And well, well, he wrote half the book, so it's okay. But why do we read the, the most of the lean? The most popular lean book was not mine. It was Womack's. Womack wrote a book called The Machine That Changed the World, professor at MIT, became the best-selling 
book in America on lean. And I just read it. I never read it before because I spent all my time reading my own books instead of reading somebody else's books. And it's a history book. It doesn't teach you lean. It teaches you some awareness of what it's about. But there's not one mention in Womack's book of one of my books, and my books are from the people that created lean. We talk about these tools. Every one of those tools came one from the productivity books, every single one of them. It was magic with me. I went to Japan, and I'd see a manager like Shingo or Ono, and I would try to find out, what do you read? What do you find of value? When I said to Shingo, Shingo said, only my books are of value. So I published 12 of his books, but they are. I'd read Shingo's green book number one. It's the first one I found. His green book, The Study of the Toyota Production System from an Engineering Viewpoint. And you can, put, you can get used copies on, on uh, you don't have to buy it from Productivity. You get used copies on Amazon and buy it. There's actually a lot of used Productivity Press books. Yeah, a lot of the used, used books Powell's there. a lot of them. It's <laughs> the fundamental, the fundamental is Shingo's work. Shingo's SMED book, How to Do Quick Changeover, was the key to Toyota's success. Ono wanted to get the flow or one piece flow. What was the block? The block was inventory. How do I get the inventory down? Well, where does inventory come from? Primarily, it comes from stamping, stamping out parts, metal parts especially. And so in order to stamp out, it took four hours to change over a press. If it took four hours to change over a press, you couldn't make just one and do a changeover. You would never sell a car. So you had to stamp out 1,000 or 5,000. General Motors took 40 hours to change over a multi-step press to press out the hoods of automobiles. 40 hours. So when they, when they, when they made a changeover, they had to press out 20,000 hoods. before. So they had a mountains of inventory at General Motors. Ono recognized that's not going to give him flow. Flow is one piece flow. The customer wants one, we make one. So how do we get the inventory down? So he goes to Shingo, and he says to Shingo, because Shingo was his consultant, and he said, Shingo, it's taking four hours to do a changeover on that press. I want you to do it in two hours. Ono asked the impossible. And Shingo's brilliant. He said, okay. You're paying me money, okay. And Shingo sat in front of that machine for days. How many of you would pay a consultant just to come into your place and sit and watch? You do, well you're unusual. <laughs> you're very unusual, because we, we very rarely do that in America. Just sit and watch. And so Shingo watched, and then Ono comes in a couple of days later, says no, two hours is no good, you gotta do it in less than 10 minutes. You got to go from four hours to less than 10 minutes, and Shingo said, okay. And he did it. Shingo watched and studied and discovered how to make that changeover in 10 minutes. Then I take Shingo to this dresser industry again, same company I mentioned earlier. We go to a punch press, taking two hours to make a changeover. Shingo teaches them a few fundamentals. Took him about an hour to teach them the fundamentals. And then he said, okay, how long is it going to take you to do what I tell you to do? And they said, well, maybe three hours. Shingo said, okay, I'll come back. But when I come back, I want you to make this two-hour changeover in 10 minutes. And he leaves. And he comes back three hours later. And they make a changeover. And they did it in 12 minutes. And Shingo had a scorn on his face. <laughs> he says, look, I told you 10. <laughs> and they did it in 12. And then he laughed, of course. Knowledge is so powerful when you really acquire it and go after it and understand it. Yes. Okay, I want to do one last question. There are many more books, but start with Chingo and Ono. Thank you. I was wondering about, you talked about um, giving team members ownership so that they can innovate. And I'm kind of struggling with the line between like, dictatorship and complete freedom. So I have a business, manufacturing, um, small team, about 10 team members. How do you get involved in either just give them complete freedom and allow them to do the innovation 
or where do you get involved? And it sounds like your business at the beginning, you were doing the innovation for them. Right. Or how do you help them along with that? Where is that framework? Or okay, how do you build it, that? it's right. You know, you, you can't, you, you know, you mean, you can't give a blowtorch to a child. You know, you can't give a, a powerful instrument to people that are not trained. So you as a manager here, how many people work for you? Nine. Okay, your job is to set the vision of the organization so you're successful. You have a lot of things to do. But when it comes to people, the role is how do I develop them to their maximum skill? Because if they develop the skill, then you trust them more. The more skill, the more trust. And who does the job for you? They do the job. Who knows the job the best? They know the job the best. You can start thinking about redesigning the job so that the skill builds up. I love Canon. A bunch of slides here, but we're not showing it. But you can, you can go to YouTube. You'll see a lot of the talks that, I, that I've given. I keep posting to YouTube, and I'll do a lot more. But Canon is actually better than Toyota. Tana has a Supermeister system. I love this system. It's called Supermeister. They have a Meister. Meister means what? Master. And so they had 26 women, primarily women, that made the whole copier by themselves. That's over a thousand parts. Takes her three hours to install it. She does it by herself. At the, end of the at the end of the three hours, the copier is all made by her, all assembled by her. She signs her name. They interviewed her, and she said, how do you feel? She said, you know, every time I make a machine, I feel like I made another baby. I mean, it shows you what people are capable of doing, but we don't do it. Volvo tried with the socio-technical system. That's another thing you should learn is socio-technical design. This is a great concept that's neglected in America. Social tech is cool. How do you make a facility that's good for people and good for technology at the same time? You don't move in technology and then move people to run the technology. That's what we do. I went to a Ford Motor Company plant. They spent $2 billion in Germany and bought the latest technology, the latest machines to make the world engines in, in Detroit. So they spent $2 billion and then they just put people in to watch the machine. I'm looking at the worker. He's reading a newspaper. He's just there just in case something goes wrong with the machine. They didn't design it for technology. You go to Volkswagen and look at the um, top car that they make today, and you'll see the worker spending 30 minutes making that subset of the car. Not three-minute tack time the way they do with Toyota or General Motors or Ford. 30 minutes. They look at that man as a master or that woman is a master to make a whole subset of the car. If people are capable of doing it, that's what you want. So make everybody in your car, that's your vision. If they get stronger and more successful, you'll be more successful. Of course, you'll have to pay them more, but you're making more. Yeah, that, sh that should be your focal point today. R and what is, who's successful in American's image? HP, Meg Whitman. I mean, she was a, wow, she made multi-millions because she made billions for Hewlett-Packard. Billions. How did she make it? She laid off 30,000 people. Yeah. What's the purpose of a company? We're all part of America. We're all part of this society. We should be making the society better. We should be solving the homeless problem instead of making the rich richer. And now we have a new tax law that's going to make the rich even richer. I don't want to get into politics. But <laughs> <laughs> Slightly we digress. Another question, please. Another one? Okay. Yes. So, um, I'm not uh, keeping your attention, though. i got to do better. You're I'm fully engaged. No, uh, I just watched your mind a minute ago, and it was worried about your questions. It's not so you. you it's the brain. It's, it's the brain. always moving. Um, so with automation and a lot of companies, um, unfortunately laying people off because we're getting better at what we do and we're not repurposing people, um, there's a lot of talk about a universal basic income. Um, I like the idea, but that's mainly because I think people can be masters in other ways and, and it opens people up to do other things. Curious what your thoughts are. I don't like that. I mean, of my first reaction is I'm focusing on people who become masters. I want to focus on building skills and capabilities for people. And I don't want to give people crutches. I don't want people to starve, but I don't want to feed them like the homeless. 
I would do what Roosevelt did. You know, he took millions and sent them out to the woods to build up American trails and, and build up, you know what I mean, and, and cabins and things like that. Teach people a skill so that they could earn, earn. You know what I mean? They, they, they value themselves when they have a skill and they're earning on their own. Yes, we don't want a people to go hungry, of course, but look what we do here. Portland's one of the best cities in America. It, it is one of the best cities in America. It's, it, it, it is, I gotta be careful, but it is in one of the states that was the worst. One of the worst. Where do you think Nazism was from a primarily 20, 30 years ago? It was here. And Portland is such a great city. You had a great senator. What was his name? You remember that great senator? No. Who? Morse. Yeah. We had a, and, and this city is great. And look at the homeless. It doesn't make sense. You should become a model. And if we did things right, there's 70 people in this room, something like that. If you unified yourself somehow together, we could end homeless in this city. It's not that difficult to end homeless. Sure, people acclimate. But how do they acclimate sleeping underneath the, underneath the bridges in the cold winter? Yeah, we have to. I mean, I can understand it. We can't let people, but I don't like the idea of paying people not to work. I would say if they went to school to learn a trade, then maybe we could pay them so they could live when they're going to school. To me, school should be free anyway. All education should be free, like, like it is in many countries. In Japan, school is free for you if you're a good student. So a lot of the people in Japan have to pay for it because they're not that good a student. Did I answer your question a little bit? You don't have to like what I'm saying, but let it sit within you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, don't want, I, do, I want people to work. I was the dumbest kid in school, and somehow I made it through life. And there's 80, 80 miracles that you could read. <laughs> no, forget about that. <laughs> yes. kind of on the same lines, but what do you think about new research that's come out about boredom and downtime for humans and how that's actually really productive, creative? Yeah, I mean, because the kind of work we give them, people get bored. But I'm, I'm trying to rest with one thing so we can understand this clearly. If we look at a great musician, Isaac Perlman, some great musician, like on the violin. In order to be great on the violin, even a great violinist will spend, what, eight, ten hours a day? Da 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 They're repeating over and over and over and over and over again. That's life. You have to repeat over and over again to refine a skill. But you don't take away the creativity from the individual. You give the opportunity for continuous growth. You're searching for perfection in whatever you're doing. And that requires you to focus. How do you focus when you're doing the same thing repetitive for three minutes? You lose your attention, and then you lose your mind. And so work is boring. The other word you use is what? Yes. the opposite <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean focus is is really is really a key of course to focus let me tell you about the mind my feeling about the mind you get 50 to 70,000 thoughts a day that's what it if you search internet 50 to 70,000 so thousand thoughts a, as I'm talking your mind is continually thinking it doesn't stop thinking and you're comparing. And what are these thoughts? They're coming from your in inner computer. So everything you experience goes into your computer, and then for some reason, it regurgitates, and it comes up. Not that you need it, it comes up. And then you have to make a choice. I love this, when an athlete, I have a beautiful video, when an athlete wins something, the interviewer says to the athlete, well, what were you thinking about when you won? What were you thinking of? 
if he really was a winner, he wasn't thinking at the time of winning. It's a funny thing of the mind because you're focused. Your mind can't, when you're, when you're in a trapeze up there, believe me, you, you, you can't think. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You, you can't think. The mind, write this down. The, I'm only repeating what I learned from others that I like. The mind is a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. Remember that. Your mind is a wonderful servant. If you use it properly, it'll give you what you need. When you say to your mind, I really want this, it'll dig deeply within you to give it to you. The mind will give it to you. The mind will really work for you. It has a great computer. And the mind, in truth, is not only connected to this computer, it's connected to all of the computers in the universe, all available to you. It's a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. And what do we do? We listen to the mind. Something pops in your head, and you go ahead and do it. Just realize how crazy you are following that mind. But that's what we all do. And that's why we're troubled in this world. The mind creates the problem w of this world today. We know the right things to do. Just read any of these religious texts. They're beautiful, but who follows them? Very few. Next, go ahead, please. Jeff, ask a question. How are we doing time-wise? Is everybody okay here? We're okay. Yeah? <laughs> All right. See, I don't have to eat at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, so I'm okay. <laughs> But I want to save some time just in case somebody wants me to sign a book. Sweet. Well, thanks for everything you're saying, Norman. Uh, I think you're a real interesting individual. And so my question kind of comes, comes back to you. And in all this studying cultures and processes and bringing all that into your life, uh, was there a point where you're like, oh, wow, I really need to make a change in my own, um, in the way I operate in this world. So I just yes, like, I yes. Like I, have, I have a good question, Jeff, because there's a couple of things I should do that I'm not doing. Because if I was a great teacher tonight, I would be asking instead of answering. That means I would bring out the answer that Norman is giving you is in the audience. And if I was really good, I would be getting you to answer the questions instead of you know popping out of my mouth. But I hope that what I do, I've been meditating for 50 years, and so I hope what I do comes from a much deeper place inside me, do you know what I mean, than just from the thoughts that pop out. That they're really coming from something real that's real within everybody. You're all connected. So I have a great lesson. I mean, I, I mean I'm 85. I don't have that much time left. 85. I have two goals. One goal, which I'm doing here, is to try to bring out the best of you. But I could have done it better by asking you more questions. And, and I have a second goal because I'm 85. I have to get off the earth. And how do you get off the earth? And we're not trained this or rarely trained this, how to get off the earth. Nobody taught this to me in school, never. And everybody dies, but they don't teach you about that in school. It seems to be a myth. Other people die, not me. It's the way people go through life. But how to die? Well, the trick is how to die consciously. Rudy once told me that you have a choice. You can be ripped out of the body when you die. You can be, you're ripped out of the body, and if you're lucky, you come back. Or you could leave consciously. And if you leave consciously, there are masters that have showed us. Jesus told us what to do, but we don't listen. Buddha told us what to do, but we don't listen. There are so many great masters that we should study and follow and learn from. So you should have two things in your life. One is to become a master here that's very practical and also to make sure you have a very good, solid spiritual life. And I don't care what your religion is. Every religion has it if you dig down to the fundamentals in that religion. I'm not sure. I have to be careful. Dangerous ground. Because what I was going to say is I'm not sure the priests know or the rabbis know. Because fundamentally they teach from the scholar, you know what I mean? They teach from the reading in the book and the books are thousands of years old. But life is right now. Life is your great teacher right now. And I'm very grateful to you for the questions and the energy in the room I think is wonderful. Not too many people are falling asleep on me.
anymore? I think I'm going to be respectful of people's time um, and of your time as well, Norman. And I also wanted to give you the opportunity to sign some books and for people to talk to you a little more there. Um, I think we've gone pretty full circle tonight on all the stuff we talked about, all the way to how to die, which is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't expect that one to be in there. Thank you. Thank so it gives me something to think about. Um, I want to really personally thank you for coming out and talking my with my us. My pleasure. He, um, he gave me... He gave me, no, not you, Matt gave me the best, he gave also very good, but Matt, <laughs> but Matt gave me the best introduction I've ever had. The only thing is, this book here, <laughs> it's not my book, but a, but a student of mine, and Matt knows this man because he worked for him, Hal McCumber, who wrote a wonderful book. It just came out, Pocket Sensei, and it really is great. It, it is 40 katas. Kata, look up what kata means. Right? Right. Kata is, is repetition, 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 and you until you got it right. And it's really wonderful. And I love the man. I'm teaching him now over Zoom, too. And uh, one of the things I love is th the acknowledgement in front of the book is to Norman Bodek, because Norman Bodek, what this book is, it takes Ono and Shingo sayings, and he creates a kata out of the saying, and the sayings came from all of my books. So I'm very happy that he, he did that. And I put it into my book, too. The, his, his acknowledgement I put into my book. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it's another miracle. So yeah, I thank, thank you, you Kelvin. I thank you, Matt, very much. Very, very much. Okay, so... Um, one person here gets a, a free signed copy of Norma's new book, and I'm just going to actually... Okay. Sorry, I was just mixing them up. Let's see who's going to win this. And the person's, the person's name is Norman Bodek. <laughs> <laughs> no, the person's name is Millard. Where's Millard? Here, Millard, you get a free signed copy of the book. Very good. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming, and I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed you very much. Okay, so one more thing. Uh, Maria's going to come up here and tell us a little bit more about Lean Portland. Also, I want to tell you all that the Portland Business Journal interviewed Norman this week, and they're going to write a story about this event and also a part of the interview they did over email with him and publish it sometime next week, along with the video of this event. So if you guys cared about what you heard about and you think that the world should know about it, please share it out with everybody you know. It would be awesome. I think it will give Norman some due credibility for all the work he's done. So thanks again, Norman, and thank you all. And then Maria's going to come out and talk a little more. Yeah, I'll make it super fast. I swear. Um, I'm Maria. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I just wanted to thank um, Grove Maid again for letting us use your space. It's great here. Um, and also, I wanted to thank PNCA for helping us design a new logo. And we have a new website. It's leanportland.com. And you can find all of our events there. Sign up for a newsletter. We also um, host a monthly happy hour. So I see a lot of new faces in this crowd here that I haven't met before. Um, if you ever just want to come have a beer, talk about lean stuff, uh, we do it every month on the first Tuesday at Lucky Lab in Northwest. So thanks again, everyone, for coming. <laughs>